So do not be confused by you know the word law. What it means is is order. So what is then? What are, there is only one order. The order of the whole, which is he calls the eternal law. Because eternal why? Because it's all encompassing. And eternal why? Because God's the order. God is reasonable. God, God is a rational God. This God that he talks about. And this his rationality is reflected here. And guess what? Our reason created in the image of God, right? From the book of Genesis. But according to Aquinas, our and uh, not only to him, <coughs> our reason is reason because meaning what? Is understanding, meaning what? It's a capacity to understand the structures of order in the world. Why? And what does this mean? It means that it reflects God's reason. Because this is how we were created in his image, you know, according to a Christian and Jewish paradigm. <coughs> Which means that this is what allows us to understand this order, because this order, say, this connection is here because it, it exists in God's reason, so to speak, or wisdom, or understanding, right? Again, inappropriate word. It's because it exists here that it exists here because God is the one who maintains this order. So why can we say it is here? Why can we understand this this relationship, right? The relationship of the la- the, 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 the the whole is bigger than the part, right? Or or any anything actually that the reason can uh, understand any relationship, you know, chemistry, and discoveries in chemistry. Right? physics or math, the ability to understand math, right? Why? Because we also have this relationship possible in our minds with education and so on. You know, you can educate a dog as long as you want. He will not become a mathematician. He can, you can push a dog as far as possible, but he will not become a mathematician. Because the dog does not have this capacity for reason. Rational animal, only the human being. Only the human being. Animals have different capacities. But there's only one rational animal that we know of, besides the aliens, right? Uh, <coughs> so, why do we understand this relationship? Is because we are made in God's image as rational creatures. This is why we understand a relationship that exists by virtue of God having made it that way. This is the relationship between our reason, God's reason, and the order of the world. They all are constant. However, however, our mind is not God's mind. Our wisdom is not God's wisdom. Furthermore, there was such a thing as the original saying, remember Augustine? So our reason is broken. But it's still good in the sense of it delivers things. But it's limited because we're not God, and also because it's broken. It can be erroneous. So here's where, this is why human beings, through, just through reason, and this goes back to Paul, Apostle, uh, to the letters of Paul in the Christian scriptures, <coughs> this is why the human being, even without, you know, he says, even the philosophers and so on can know about, even about God, only using reason. Just like Plato, or, you know, right? He pointed towards the form of the good and so on. So, reason points you towards its origin, so to speak. But it's limited. And this limit of how much we can at- attain only using our natural reason is how much we can understand from the order of the whole, the principles that have a hold together the order of the whole. That's the part of the eternal law that we can call natural law. Right. It is not a separate law, this is, the, this is the only order, the eternal law. But the part of it that we can understand, let's call it natural law. Well, how about the part that we don't understand, how about, how about knowing about God, since we don't have the mind of God, how do we, how do we get there? Well, this is where revelation comes into place. And revelation is all those things that we are being given, or told, or conveyed um, with from the initiative, from God's initiative, and, uh, initially, but you know, through human beings. So, for example, the Jewish scriptures, 
Old Testament for the Christians, or the New Testament for the Christians, uh, the Scriptures, right? Or the, the teachings of the Church, right? Which is viewed in the Christian framework of the time. And <coughs> not only, right? For the Orthodox Catholics, there's still the, this is the framework. The Church is the instrument of God through which this revelation continues. Nothing new is brought up, but you know, the, it's the same sort of uh, instrument. So, in any case, this is the framework within which Aquinas works. So, <coughs> revelation is what Aquinas would call a third sort of law, right? Which is what? Which is divine law. And divine law is not this, the part that we can't attain to. Divine law is simply the things that God has made us aware of, right? And some of these things that God has made us aware of, for example, you know, divine law, the Ten Commandments is divine law, right? is those things that have been revealed. And if the scriptures are part of divine law and the teaching of the church, in the scriptures you have the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament according to the Christians, for the Jewish people, the Jewish scriptures that they still read today, right? So divine law is, is what is revealed there. Well, Ten Commandments, uh, one of the commandments is do not kill. Don't take the life of someone unjustly, right? Well, that is something that we also know through reason. So it's also part of what we could call Natural law, meaning those things that we know to reason. So divine law, this is why I drew it so weirdly, strangely here, is because divine law tells us things that some of them we know through natural law. I know it's, it's in us that killing is wrong. It is a, it's in us, right? But there are also things that we wouldn't know, for example, things about, you know, um, things that we don't know. Things about the angels, the existence of angels, or whatever for within this framework, right? That is something that reason itself doesn't, doesn't get there. Or things about God himself. In the Christian theology, that's, for example, that God is a trinity, you know, three persons in one. That's the part of the Christian theology. But that's something that we could not really guess through reason. It's not part of natural law. And that's the Bible. Okay. So, where do we, when do we get to uh, politics? Well, the question right in politics is how should we live? Uh, how do we live together? That's what politics is about, it's about life together. And for that you ask what is human being, what is society, what is the purpose, and so on. So, <coughs> if this is the city, life in the city for the inhabitants and uh, the purpose of the city needs to be ordered, right? Any city is ordered. Whether you pass a law or by tradition, or just custom in the tribe, or what uh, habits that they have inherited, every single community has an order. You know, has an order, has a has a way of being together that uh, otherwise it's not a city, it's not a society. It's just you know people running into each other mindlessly. So every society is has an order, and that order is its law, whether or not it is passed by someone or not. That's its law. You know, this is why in England, in the, the United Kingdom, there is no constitution, but there is a constitution. Because all the ways through which the system has been established, as we'll see later, are part of its unwritten constitution. And it's very strong. And it has lasted and has kept the United Kingdom up to today, successfully. And yet there's not one document. Right? So, this order of the city is its law. Now, the question becomes, how should we live, right? Well, law, what makes something a law? Now, in Aquinas, there are a few conditions that he raises for something to be a law. One, it has to be passed by someone with authority. Someone with legitimate authority. So, someone who is in charge with something needs to pass that edict. Obviously, who is in charge with the whole God. So, a decision passed by, you know, a statement of order is actually a reality, so it is passed by someone with authority. The second, it needs to be promulgated. And some of the excerpts you have in your textbook deal with this. What does it mean? Promulgated? It needs to be announced, posted, made available. Right? Law is not law unless it is posted. Right? 
Well, how is the eternal law posted? Well, it is posted in as much as it is an order that is knowable, and it's everywhere. We, everything we know about the world, in the chemistry class when we describe it, it's basically our uh, description of something that has been posted. We didn't make it. We don't, can't just come up with, oh yeah, actually, water is not H2O, water is uh, potassium something. Well, you know, you can say whatever you want, it's just not true. So our, everything we know about the world is because of the fact that the, it, the relationships of order, this law, has already been made available to us. So, promulgated, yes. The third one, it needs to be towards the common, oriented towards the common good. Is the law, eternal law, the order of the law, oriented towards the common good? Yes, because God created the world uh, actually for man, for the human being, but uh, because he, uh, he created uh, everything that there is is good. And it is for the good of those God created in Christian theology. So a fourth condition for something to be a law, and here's the, here's the powerful thing, it has to be in accordance to reason. So, only that is law which accords with reason. Why reason? Again, because of this. Because, it's, because the order of the whole is rational. It is rational. And thus, something that is not part of the, not rational, is also not part of the order of the whole. It doesn't correspond. Once, once again, the fact that the whole has an order, right, it means that's, that's, that means that it's rational, meaning that it can be comprehended, whether by the human being or by the God who created it. Right? But if the fact that there is a, a relationship of meaning, a, a connection, that itself is the essence of rationality. Right? Um, we understand only things that, uh, connections that already exist. We don't make them up, right? Discoveries, scientific discoveries. I discover that something there is. I discover something that there already is there. You know, gravity. I discover it, but I didn't invent it. It's not like before Newton, the, the apples didn't fall from the tree; they went upwards. No, gravity already functions. It's me who discovers. We are part of an order, and our knowledge is discovery of this order. Remember, the origin of philosophy from Plato on is wonder. We, we philosophize, meaning we pursue wisdom, pursue knowledge, because we want to know. And why? Because of this attitude of desire of knowledge, what Plato calls wonder. Right? The wonder that things are, which attracts us to know about. So, back to the city. These are the criteria for law. And Aquinas goes through each of them and shows that the order of the whole, what he calls eternal law, corresponds with each. God created it, authority, God showed it, promulgated. <coughs> it's for the good of the whole, everyone, everything that there is, common good, and it's according to reason. Why? Because it's rational, and because it comes from the wisdom of God. Okay, how about natural law? Uh, the same, because natural law is just what we understand from the whole. How about divine law? The same, because it's God's revelation of, which we know through what? Through faith. This is why they're complementary. It, Divine law is known through faith. Natural law is known through reason. As you see, they overlap. As you see, they complement each other because they're all part of this whole order of the whole which relates to God. But, how about then the city? Well, here's the order of the city is subject to human law. And here's where human law becomes extremely powerful. Because which you know, human law is a law passed by a ruler. For the positivist that I mentioned with the Nuremberg trial, any law passed by any ruler at any time, Hitler passes the law, it's a law. But it's not, as we have discovered at the Nuremberg trial. We can't accept that as being a law because it's not just. I can enforce something uh, criminal. I can make it the law to kill everyone who is of a different race. Right, as Hitler did. Okay? That is a violent anger I can enforce, but it's not a law. 
Because only that is law, remember, that is passed by someone with legitimate authority, promulgated, you would say, okay, Hitler had the first two, maybe, maybe, but not the third, the common good. And for, for the most, and finally, not the fourth, according to reason. How do we know that it wasn't according to reason? We know it because it was not in accordance to natural law. Because only that is law, which is in accordance with the order of the whole. Which is in accordance with, for example, one of the key principles of natural law, do no harm to other human beings. Which we know instinctively, that it's wrong to hurt other human beings, right? That's a key principle of natural law. It's a key thing that we know by being human, simply, we have it in us, right? So, laws that contradict the order of the whole are not laws. Because the entire thing is rational. The entire thing is rational. So, so laws that contradict these things that are according to the order of the whole are irrational. Are wrong. So human laws will be human laws in as much as they correspond with natural law. And this is why. This is why the founders, the framers of the US Constitution. This is why at Nuremberg trial, what was the reference in both cases, 150 years apart, that by nature, human beings are this and this and this. Right? Remember the Declaration of Independence. The human beings, according to their nature and to nature's God, right, have certain rights, said the framers. Right? We can debate if that's whatever. But they made an appeal to an order that this is how we are, this is who we are. We are entitled to life, liberty, and whatever. Of course, that's a locked in interpretation, but that's a different question. But they said, according to nature, same in the Nuremberg trial, according to nature, you should not commit genocide, you should not kill, you should not send to death millions of people because of their race. So this is the key aspect about human law. Human law being laws passed by human beings. That they need to correspond with all these. And contrary to assumptions, the Middle Ages was not a time of lawlessness at all. And it was not a time of absolute rulers, which is even more interesting. It was a time when rulers were bound by the fact that they ruled over something that was just a small aspect of the destiny of, of the human being. The human being was not dominated and controlled by the regime, as in totalitarian regimes later, centuries later. You know, communism, Nazism, when you, they want to control everything that you are, and change it. Right? No, in the Middle Ages, it was clear that human being is only a pilgrim, remember, resting through this world, and the ruler is called, doesn't mean that they did it, but is called to act for the good, as a shepherd, whatever, for the good of the people in the city. And the ruler is not governing the eternal destiny of the human being. That was a declaration of freedom for the human being from which will actually emerge later the whole idea of individual freedom and rights and whatever. It comes from there, from the idea that the human being has a destiny that goes beyond this world. And the rulers of this world cannot control that destiny. So, this is a brief overview. I welcome your questions if you want to send me an email. Uh, obviously, you use the textbook as well, and um, I encourage you, you know, uh, to read, uh, to go to the sources, to read the last and read the quietness later, uh, <coughs> because um, and Aristotle and Plato, they are truly um, giants of thought. So I hope you enjoy this, and we will. The next video lecture will be on uh, Machiavelli. Today I will post some texts from the textbook section on Machiavelli. Thank you.